Hi everybody. I'm kind of confused about American law, and I'm wondering maybe if someone can help clear a few things up for me. Because uh, I'm, I'm mainly confused about this whole concept of fighting words, um, which as I understand it is an unprotected category of speech. It's not covered by free speech in America, so people can't plead the First Amendment if they use fighting words. And I'm just quoting here, yeah, I'm just looking this up on the web, quoting uh, from the Supreme Court's ruling on Szczepinski versus New Hampshire, which as I understand it is the whole origin of the, the idea of fighting words. And they said, it is well understood that the right of free speech is not absolute at all times and under all circumstances. There are certain well-defined, narrow, narrowly limited classes of speech, the prevention and punishment of which has never been thought to raise any constitutional problem. These include the lewd and obscene, the profane, the libelous, and the insulting or fighting words, those which by their very utterance inflict injury or tend to incite an immediate breach of the peace. It has been well observed that such utterances are no essential part of any exposition of ideas and are of such slight social value as a step to truth that any benefit may be derived from them is clearly outweighed by the social interest in order and morality. Resort to epithets or personal abuse is not in any proper sense communication of information or opinion safeguarded by the Constitution, and its punishment as a criminal act would raise no question under that instrument." End quote. So, that's kind of, as I understand it, su sums up fighting words in its origin, at least. And when people like Thunderfoot say things like, you don't have a right not to be offended, um, that seems to conflict very much with this, because it says here, words which, by their very utterance, inflict injury. If they're not a protected category of speech, then that would mean people do actually have some something of a right not to be offended. So thunder, according to what we have there, Thunderfoot would actually be wrong, um, which would not be the first time. However, as I've looked further and further into this, I'm finding that the Supreme Court seem very... Uh, inconsistent in how they enforce fighting words. There seem to be like a number of cases in which um, some people have been charged for fighting words and some people haven't. Or rather, people have been convicted by city law or state law um, for using fighting words, but those convictions have been overturned by the Supreme Court. Uh, which, as I understand it, is how American law works. It's one of the reasons I find it confusing because you've got state law and then you've got federal law. Um, and of course you've got 50 states, so uh, it's it very head wrecking having to look at this. But as I understand it, the federal law ultimately has the final say. So presumably the Supreme Court has the final say in what is and isn't constitutional. Um, but some of these things have been, some of these convictions have been upheld. And it seems very inconsistent, as to, you know, just sc scrolling through here, how they've done this. They seem to some things which seem al almost identical. Um, I'm looking at the, there's this fuck the draft example here. A guy walking into court wearing a shirt with the words fuck, yeah, jacket, bearing the words fuck the draft. Apparently that was that wasn't considered fighting words. I think he was charged, but I think this was overruled. Yeah, Supreme Court disagreed. Um, but I think a lot of these cases, from what I've looked at, it's more—it's not so much that um, the, the, the the rules of fighting words have changed. It just seems to me more that the city in question or the state in question was a little bit too broad with what they categorised as fighting words, and they need to keep it quite narrow. They need to say it's, uh, just this because they were including a number of things that were protected speech in their laws against fighting words, and because of that, that's, I think that's why they were getting these convictions overruled, as far as I can gather. This is what I mean, though, I find American law very confusing. Um, I mean, I find British law confusing as well, but the fact is we've only got a small number of countries to, <laughs> to look at there. We, we don't have, like, 50 states to deal with. We've basically got <laughs> a very small number of states. Um, but if someone could shed a bit of light on that for me, that would be good. Um, but it seems, I mean, I've also looked a little bit at this controversy regarding colleges, uh, or universities as we call them, um, education institutes, and how a lot of them are not allowing certain activities 
or freedoms of expression on campus due to um, fighting words. That's what they claim. They've said that oh, it's, it's fighting words. But some of these, again, have been overturned um, by the Supreme Court, um, which I find, I've got to say, I find it a bit odd that a university should be considered, you know, overall should be considered an area for free speech. Um, surely there should be areas of free speech. There should be, people should have opportunities to express their views. But the Educational Institute as a whole surely should be there for education, not just for expression of public opinion, because we have places we can do that. That's just, like, my immediate thoughts there. You know, I find it a bit odd that the education institute should just be expected to host everyone's opinions. I mean, surely it's a place where educators come and educate. And if people want to express their own opinions, there would be certain spaces to do that, I would have thought. Uh, which seems to be what they're trying to do. They have free speech zones. Um, but I find all this very odd. But I've noticed a lot of people, especially on the internet, including I've noticed Americans particularly are a quite big on free speech, um, possibly a little bit more than most of us. In the UK we're very, we like free speech as well, but I don't think we're quite as obsessive about it, and I think that's probably because in America, look, having a cursory look at history, I think it took them a long time to get it, uh, which is why they're into it, but a lot of people don't realise that what actually does and doesn't constitute free speech. A lot of people seem to think free speech is something that's guaranteed to them by everyone, because it's only something guaranteed to them by the government. It basically protects them from government interference. Um, but yeah, I find that really odd. If someone could maybe shed a bit of light on that for me, it'd be good. I mean, the, the other problem here is this. I would include, having looked at a little bit at UK law, I would include a lot of what Americans call fighting words under hate speech. But apparently a lot of places in America don't have hate speech laws. Um, so that's a bit confusing. There's a little bit of terminology clashing a bit here. Um, but I'd say, yeah, I mean, the people who object to hate speech, or the idea of hate speech laws, who say they're a bit overzealous, do tend to be people um, from the kind of white, male, heterosexual, cisgendered, middle class, or above kind of demographic, basically from that intersection. And people who tick most of those boxes, so people who aren't usually going to be on the receiving end of any kind of hate speech, um, you know, they might receive... Uh, offensive speech to them based on them as an individual, but that's not really a problem. That's, that means someone's familiar with them as an individual and has expressed their distaste for them. Um, it's when an entire, you're dismissed entirely based on the fact you belong to a certain racial group or a certain gender or whatever else, or a certain area of the class ladder. That's when we're kind of in hate speech area, I'd have thought. And while it's okay, you know, it's fair for people to be critical of that idea. You know, if it's mostly coming from the people who are the least common targets for hate speech, you, you know, it, it, I'm going to need a little bit more to be convinced of that, because really we need to listen to the opinions of a lot more people, including including and especially the people who actually are victims of hate speech. So, yeah, let me know what you think, everyone. Goodbye. Mm.